metamorphic is change, you know, changing from coal to a diamond. Well, when we change, we create rocks for our clients. And but then I realized that wasn't enough. Hi, I'm Matt Eagle, the host of the CX and Culture Connection, the podcast for CX leaders looking to drive an ROI from their investments in CX and culture together. Uh, I'm excited to be here today with Sean Albertson, who's the founder and CEO of CX for Rocks. Thanks for joining us today, Sean. Thank you so much for having me. It's exciting to, to be able to have this conversation with you. I appreciate the opportunity. Great. Well, I, I've really enjoyed reading your book, uh, For Rocks. Uh, and uh, people can go check that out on my website if they're interested in seeing the book review and uh, and, and learning more about uh, Sean's book. We'll be talking about that more today and some of the work he's been doing with clients. Um, so I, I really loved your framework about removing rocks and how this links to cu customer effort. Uh, just to get us going, Sean, do you want to share a little bit more about uh, what the four rocks are and how, how you think about removing them along the customer journey? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's kind of funny that it all actually starts from my kids. Um, you know, we're in, here in Colorado, love the Rocky Mountains. And we were about 2008. We were our three little boys. We were in the mountains and this beautiful meadow with this river running through it. And uh, the boys are just going crazy like boys do, right? Jumping, splashing, and everything. And my youngest stops. He looks at me and says, Dad, why does this river not flow straight? And I did the dad thing. I made something up. I sounded really confident. We were about to move on. Uh, but then my oldest son pipes up. Oh, I know that one. He, he had learned about it in school. He's like, it's the rocks. They get in the way. Well, I'd been doing CX for so long, but I'd always been focusing on delighting customers. And that statement from my son hit me. And I was like, no matter what we try to do to delight, if our customers are hitting the rocks, it's making their journey longer. And then I started thinking, wow, the rapids and so I started to geek out a little bit on geology. So I actually studied rocks a little bit. And I found there are three rocks on Earth that you know are make up basically all rocks on Earth, sedimentary. Well, if you think about business and rocks in business, there's nothing more common than sed sedimentary. Layers of complexity, different departments doing different things, uh, acquisitions and merge. I mean, think of how much silos we see. So sedimentary is very common. Igneous. Uh, which is fire, trial by fire. Think of that. I, I did a lot of time in, in uh, telco. Outages were huge fires that we had to deal with that were major rocks and roadblocks for our customers. Metamorphic is change, you know, changing from coal to a diamond. Well, when we change, we create rocks for our clients. And But then I realized disruption. that wasn't enough. Yeah, is that disruption, any sort of that disruption. And then I realized three wasn't enough. I needed four rocks. And Ultimately, I was thinking about COVID and realized there's outside forces. So I kind of said, hey, let's throw in meteors in there. So really thinking about how these rocks are on Earth, it really all of our business rocks kind of fall into one of those categories and understanding them and understanding what we can do to both avoid them. But then what we do when we find them, it's kind of been a key for the Four Rocks book and, uh, and in my coaching and consulting I do today. I love the way you talk about the four different types of rocks and how uh, you can spot clues for, you know, the different types of ways that they're impacting the customer experience. Um, you know, how does this play into the customer journey? You know, I could see from a broader, uh, you know, customer transformation with, the, with, the, with a, a company, you might, you know, use this as a way of thinking about, you know, where do we want to focus our energy? What, what are we reacting to? How does this map back to the customer journey? Absolutely. Well, that customer journey is the river. And, you know, they're hoping, we hope we've developed a nice, smooth, lazy river, but they're the ones facing the rapids. Well, those rocks, those things we describe are the one, things they're bouncing off of. And in today's environment, the journey is so much more complex. I mean, it used to be like snail mail and maybe a call center. Now it's, you know, chat bots, chat, text messaging, social media. I mean, you've got so many ways that a, you communicate with your customers and your customers communicate with you. And that journey becomes longer because of the multi-channels. And one of our biggest you know, cha channel uh, challenges in business is that it takes everyone to create the experience the customers face because they own all these different channels. But more often those not, than not, those rocks are showing up along that journey. In fact, in many times the rocks are more prominent between channels when you're trying to go from the website to calling someone and the person on the other end doesn't know the research you've done for the last 30 minutes. They're just trying to you know start over. And so 
understanding in today's world, that journey is the key. Connecting, you know, that expectation uh, is, is the expectation of customers. Seamless customer journey. You know, we talk about effortless. We talk about frictionless, seamless. It's it's really all about connecting those channels because it's not about one channel, one task. We've gotten pretty good at that. It's about the journey and the connection between those channels and tasks. And that's where most of those rocks show up, especially those sedimentary, the silos and the lack of communication. It's big time. So you shared a personal story, Sean, about how the river and the rocks connected with you. I'm going to share a personal story also in a way that I think is very aligned to the way you're thinking about how the experience flows and how their connection points. Um, you know, and uh, some of the listeners have heard me tell this before, which is that I, I like to think about experience as collage artwork. And my mom's a collage artist. Um, and so, so that's on the cover of my own book, the, the CX and Culture Connection is my mom's artwork. It's very personal to me. And I had a conversation with her once, like you were having a conversation with your son, it just kind of hit me, that experience has layers and their connection points. And there's, you're, when you have a good experience, it's adding a piece to the collage. When you have a bad experience, it's adding a piece to the collage. And they layer and they connect to each other. And then doing good experience design is about seeing the connections and about being intentional about new pieces you add to the collage with the customer, not just reacting to what's there. And I can see your, your metaphor of the river as being similar, where there's constant experiences over time. And what's going to be memorable for people are the rocks. Like they don't necessarily remember the whole journey down the river, but when, they, when they're in between some rocks, it's more likely to be memorable and be something that you need to pay attention to. Oh, absolutely. And I love that collage and, and interesting point. You know, your mom did your cover of your book. My youngest son did the cover of my book. So he's a aspiring graphic design. So that's awesome. No, it, that's it, it really is. And, it, you know, and the connection or lack thereof is what is, you know, causing so much of this, this uh, t today's challenges. And it's, it's because businesses are not run you know, thinking about the full journey. There are some out there that are doing a really good job. And I've worked with some companies that have, but for the most part, and it's human nature to just focus on what you can focus on, narrow your focus to just my stuff. But that's when we start to break down for our, our customers and we create those challenges. When you think about the rocks on the journey, does that tend to like gravitate towards pain points in the journey? Or how do you think about the difference between love points and pain points on the journey? Yeah, my focus is on the, the pain points. Those rocks for me are the things that the cu customer is stumbling over or bouncing off of. And if you think of the river in a raft or whatever, it's the things that are getting in the way that are causing things to be more difficult and more challenging. Um, and again, the, the reason I do that, it goes back to kind of uh, where a lot of this for me hit home was back in 2013, when the book, The Effortless Experience came out. I know Matt Dixon, I know Rick DeLisi, and uh, I've actually shared stages with those guys. And, and going back to an understanding, they talked about that in their book. And it was kind of a, a foundation for mine is to say, no matter what you try to do to delight your customers, you really, it's hard to create loyalty at scale. You can do it once or once in a while, but you know, nine times out of 10, you don't have the opportunity to create, create you know, that kind of delight you know, and wow moments. But what you can do is if, if things are hard to do, you absolutely create disloyalty. The harder things are, you create disloyalty. And in my research, I started out like their research and I was finding, you know, if something's hard, a customer's four times more likely to be at risk for loyalty, a trit, churn, negative revenue, negative assets, whatever in your business or industry. I'm finding though today, five times more likely. It's growing because we're all getting, you know, way too used to this, you know, easy phone, you know, everything's on the phone and easy. And if it's not, I'm like, I'm going to go find somebody else where it is easy. Um, I'll, I'll tell a story about that. My son, I just mentioned he's in college right now. Uh, he was a senior in high school. He was applying for uh, colleges. He would only apply for colleges on his phone. Most colleges aren't ready for that. And he was stuck at the the school he ended up going to, he was stuck. It wasn't working. And he kept going back and saying, well, it looks like it's done. And, and we're like, my wife and I are like, you might want to go to the website. You might want to call them. You know, you need to, he was like, oh, but I, it's, it's on the phone. Six weeks went by and sure enough, he was stuck, but he didn't know it because he wasn't thinking about, and he almost decided, well, man, if they're, if they're 
website doesn't work on my phone, then why would I want to go to a college like that? So it's it's becoming even more real for the younger generation. It's all about the experience. They don't buy products and services for what the products and services do. A lot of times they buy them for the experiences they create and the ability to take selfies and, and post them on social media. I'm going to date myself now that when um, I was in college at Dartmouth, they were actually a learning lab for Apple. Uh, and it was 1993 I graduated. And um, we had email and web stuff before email was nationally popular. So I, uh, I got used to like all this internet and email access. And then I graduated and I was like, well, why isn't everyone using email? And obviously that was before, you know, that was back before the, even Google really took off. Right? Yeah, exactly. But uh, exactly. Yeah, it's good. I've been working, working at this for more than 25 years and I can actually remember using pay phones in the airport, right? Oh yeah. Pay phones and paper surveys. Remember paper surveys when you did your research and that was the only way. Oh my goodness. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the, um, the focus on uh, pain points and, and the rocks makes a lot of sense given the importance for retention and loyalty. Um, uh, and, and then also it creates a natural linkage to why you focus so much on the customer after effort score. Do uh, you want to talk a little bit more about, you know, where you see customer effort score fitting into the kind of the broader CX system and metrics? Yeah. Again, I think it's, it's one of, let, let, I, I'm not, I never say that there's one measurement. In fact, uh, I think that's one of the things that, you know, we all, you often hear about net promoter score. Well, the one, you know, the perfect or the ultimate question, the reality is it's always a suite of questions. Um, and so what I look at and the way that, that I have always focused on the measurement is what is it predicting? Because if, if I'm just measuring let's say satisfaction of an agent performance, I'm trying to look at that and say, did that predict any actual behavior? And I never found any connection of overall satisfaction or customer satisfaction to predicting a behavior by a client. It, it would happen sometimes, but the reality was it wasn't there in mass. But going back, when, when looking at the effort score, that showed the prediction, like I said, four, now five times more likely to. And in fact, when put together with the suite of services, what we found was uh, CES, customer effort score, high effort, you know, again, five times predicted uh, a detractor within N NPS. And then within NPS, the detractor predicted disloyalty. And so it's almost kind of a becoming a prediction because the, one of the drawbacks of N NPS is because done right, it's a relationship survey. There's so many influences, hard to kind of often really figure out what to do with that one survey by itself. Pair it up with customer effort score. Now there's nothing more actionable than going to the business and saying, these are the things your customers say are hard. Go fix them. I mean, that's that's the epitome of actionable. Yeah, I want to dig on this a little bit. Um, and and if you forgive me, broaden the aperture a little bit for the audience. Like what I think what we're talking about here, Sean, is that you need to focus on outcomes, not just listening for its own sake. And if you don't really, uh, and this is a big focus in your book, is if you, if you, the reason you're addressing these rocks is because working on them and your break methodologies being pragmatic and how you, you think about the rocks to, to make sure you're driving the right business outcomes through, and, and then, and the rocks give you a way to kind of think about where you can have impact and how to tailor your approach to get the right outcomes. And love, you know, so, so focusing on outcomes is key. And then your customer listening needs to help you predict the outcomes. It becomes a diagnostic tool and an ongoing signal that you can pay attention to the right things. And I think the rocks and the break methodology that you'll share more about is a way to really focus your own effort in the company so you can have an impact in a measurable way on those outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and when you think about finding rocks in a business, it's not like most businesses don't know they've got problems. And they probably know most of what their problems are. And that's actually one of the biggest challenges. They've got too many, so they don't know where to focus. And so going back to the purpose of measurement, if you now know what you're measuring and how it predicts a behavior that you want to change, reduce disloyalty or the flip side, create loyalty, you want, you want to make sure you're finding the most impactful and you've got to use all the data available. And so I already mentioned surveys, customer effort score being a core to that, but it's not just a survey methodology. In fact, it's less about surveys these days than it is about journey analytics or text analytics. 
operational metrics and the use of AI, bringing the power of today's environment together. Because you may understand that uh, you, a certain set of surveys gets a, a low score, but when you pair that up with, let's say, a call transcript, now you can study and say, well, what was the call about that received the low score? And what was the problem? You could study that through the text uh, text analytics. Add that to journey analytics. Now you can say, well, wow, they were online. You know, they tried the mobile app, then they tried online, then they tried to chat with somebody and they said call. And then they got bounced around between two different departments. I mean, that that's the journey defined using journey analytics and stitching that data together. But then other things like operational metrics, like repeat calls or even handle time within the context center can say, well, it took a long time to resolve this issue. It must be more complex. We need to look at the, the process. So to kind of bring it together, for instance, most businesses know top call drivers. That's the easiest thing to grab. And in most organizations, the executives are right. Well, we need to reduce call volume. So let's go after those first. But guess what? Since those get more support than anything else, they're usually not the worst experiences. The worst experiences are the ones that happen few and far between that are not practiced by the agents, where there is no self-help online, where there is no additional self-service. Those are the ones that become the most painful and actually create a higher level of churn than those top call drivers. So again, going back to your purpose, are you looking to just reduce calls or are you looking to reduce churn? And it, it's easy to say reduce calls is, is uh, very important cost-wise, but again, for a business, reducing churn is the most important. So putting those pieces together, understanding how the metrics and the text and journey analytics fit together with the survey to validate you know, those results. Now you're putting it together because now what you can do is use this, the percentage of people that take surveys and predict what the effort would have been for everybody else that didn't take a survey, everybody else that talked to you. And it's an amazing opportunity. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. I, I, um, I hear in what you're describing some parallels to the way Qualtrics talks about X and O data, experience data and operational data. Um, you know, I like that language. You know, I, 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 I think it's a good uh, framework uh, that there's lots and lots of X data out there, which is what people are thinking, feeling and saying, you know, and, and to your point, it's not just surveys anymore. There's a lot of X data out there that you can get from the call verbatims, from the uh, social media, from uh, ratings and reviews, from messaging. Uh, you know, in, in many, many companies now, the volume of messaging is like 10 times higher than the surveys. You know, so um, and, and that's all mineable with AI, to your point. So that's all X data. But guess what? You're swimming in operational data, too. And often the operational data is in silos and the companies are often looking at um, things at, you know, in the operational data that they're not laddering up to the true outcome they want. So rather than folk, like your point, you could have operational data about uh, call volume. But if the outcome you really want is to reduce churn rather than to reduce call volume, you should measure the, that outcome and then make the, make the linkage between your X and O data and the outcome. Well, and, and volume obviously is part of the the math, if you will, of of predicting the experience as well. But you're right; you're trying to you're trying to understand the real, actual examples through that data analysis. We we've been talking about data driven decisions forever. Now's the time to start to capitalize, and now's the time to leverage things like generative AI to study that data to really kind of understand and summarize what you're seeing in mass. A lot of focus on the analytics side of really driving. And we've been using AI in analytics for a very long time, personalization for marketing and all sorts of things. So it's not really new. It's just a, a new way to interact with that AI through the generative sense and being able to summarize. And there's some use cases to bring channels and uh, together in the call center that will reduce the or create the seamless experience. And those are the opportunities. And when I coach and consult with companies today, you know, we, we look at what they already have because more often than not, most of what you need is already being measured in your business in some form. There may be a few pieces and it goes back to connecting the data and thinking differently about how to use the data is more often really what, what a company needs to do. They don't have to invest millions of dollars in technology. It's use what you already have, just use it in a new way, linking those pieces together. Doesn't take it, it will take work, but it doesn't necessarily take a lot of funding either. One of the things that surprisingly I find um, that is missing in many companies 
is this connection between CX and brand promise. They intuitively know they want the CX to be congruent with their brand. But very often, it's hard to know whether their CX is, in fact, congruent with the brand because they haven't defined the attributes of the brand promise clearly enough and then started to listen to them in a way that's scalable. So one of the things that AI is enabling us to do now that we couldn't do with surveys in the past because you're limited by the structure of the survey questions is we can actually define the behaviors you want and the, the, the experience that you want to deliver and then start seeing, well, did that show up in the call and for, for your customer agents? Did the right behavior show up in the call that were congruent with your brand promise? Not just were people empathetic and were people listening and was there problem resolution, you know, emotion and problem resolution, but were there specific behaviors around courtesy or uh, being solution oriented or being friendly or like, can you actually define what are the attributes of your brand, listen for it, and then train for that? Uh, in your employee employee uh, training and, and and motivation to get the right behaviors you want. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, that it's kind of funny. I, I speak, obviously speak at a lot of conferences as, as I know you do as well. And you go to the, 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 the rooms with all the vendors and you're like, wow, you use AI for this. You use AI for this. You use AI for this and this and this. It's like, why don't you all work together? Cause then AI would do everything. But again, businesses and, and vendors that their products silo a little bit as well, just like we are in business to focus. But the reality is yes, the new technology can connect better. And a lot of those game changing businesses now and vendors and solution providers are doing the connective tissue. So if I'm online and then I call, the agent can literally see what I was doing online, but in summary, because you don't want to look at web logs and read through that. You want generative AI to summarize what they were doing online as a, hey, this might be what they're calling about. So there's all sorts of ways to make that connection and uh, allow for there to be more seamless interaction uh, as well. I want to bring it back for a moment. Um, as much as I know we could go on for a long time together um, about AI and about how it applies to CX, um, cause you're, you really have a unique perspective around the rocks and, and your methodology. So I want to bring this back to that and spend a little more time about, uh, your break methodology that you feature in the book about how, how you can then tailor your approach more closely to the type of rock. Cause some rocks you can't change and you have to work around it. And some you can actually break up and remove. Do you want to explain what the acronym stands for and then, and how it maps back to the different types of rocks? Absolutely. Well, when, when thinking about rocks, of course, I, my mind uh, went back to the cartoons of the chain gang, you know, with breaking rocks on the side of the road. And, and I was like, well, break, you know, that's what we want to do. Ultimately, we want to break rocks. But that that is actually there's five different activities that can happen when you find a rock. The B and break, you can blast it, you can blow it up. The reality is there may be something so bad that, you know, you, you have to like, oh, my gosh, I've got to remove that right now. I got to blow up a piece of technology. I got to blow up a process and start over immediately. The the impetus there is you got to watch out for blasting because there's a lot of collateral damage. But if something's bad enough, you may just want to rip and then deal with other rocks because you you blew it up. But it's bad enough. You need to take action. Now, obviously, the most common is remove the R and break. You got to remove a rock. You want to you want to find it in the river. In this case, you know, get a backhoe or whatever else and, and move it out, you know, re- you know, over time through project management, a little more structure than blast, you want to remove it and, and fix it, basically fix the problem and get it out of the way of the customer. Those are the most, you know, the two that you're like, all right, yeah, if we could, if we could do that, great. But then there's actually, you, you're, again, you've got a lot of rocks you're going to find. The E for, for break is actually erode. You may find rocks that you can't do anything about right now, but you can you can tinker with it. You can do little things. You can change and tweak processes, even though it's a technology issue. You can tweak training. The key there being is let it erode over time. Do little bits. As you're doing other work, always come back and say, is there a little incremental change we can do to this to erode that rock away? Maybe eventually you, you get to a point where like, now I can fund it and I can remove it. But over time, you've made those small improvements. The A is uh, accept. There are going to be some that you just have to accept that you can't erode them. You can't do any little things. They literally, you're stuck with them, at least for now. 
So you accept the rock for now, but you don't ignore it. You don't forget about it. You accept it for now. It stays on your running list of these are things we need to improve, but you got to understand and accept that I just can't do anything about it right now. And then the last one, the K is keep. There may be rocks you have to keep. Not just accept, you have to keep them because, and think about this, you know, password resets, privacy rules, validation of caller. I mean, all the things that protect the client, a lot of times they're rocks to the client or the customer, but they're there for a reason. And you want to actually embrace those when you keep them and focus on how to position them better, how to make sure they're understood the value of that rock and why it might be uh, you know, necessary. Those are the ways that you kind of keep it. So again, B B R E A K looking at those different things you can do. Because again, the, the key though, is you're always keeping that running list of the, of the rocks that you're working on based on the priority of what the data told you and assigning them to those categories. And then I you know, have worked with companies where they develop rocks teams and those teams get together monthly and they're dividing up the work, they're revisiting the list, they're adding new to the list because things change all the time. Uh, and they're really focused on that, making sure that they're, they're understanding how that framework can help them move forward. Uh, because again, it may be great to think you can remove everything right up front. The reality is you have, things fall into those different categories as you go. I love this um, idea about tailoring your approach to the rocks and, and being sensitive to culture and change management. And, and you know, you, you call that on the book, the, the importance of culture. Uh, and, and, and thinking about how you work with and evolve your culture and how CX and culture go together and, and being pay attention to paying attention to change management is, is, is part of your great methodology. You know, so I, that's, that, I mean, that's really well done. No, thank you. I appreciate it. And it, it is. And culture doesn't solve everything. You know, you can have great culture and still not be working well together, uh, you know, in this purpose. So it's, it's culture and process. You know, you have to bring that together. Um, I, I like to talk about it in my keynotes, like, you know, uh, aligning your people first, then you refine your processes to both measure effectively and these kind of uh, reasons and processes to, of improvement. And then you can design your platforms. So, you know, technology isn't always the shouldn't always be the first solution, because if you get your people and your processes ready first, then new technology can add more value to the platform versus just being another siloed uh, piece of technology thrown out to the to the customer. Yeah, I'm a fan of acronyms. I love the break acronym you have in my own book. I actually organized the entire book around an acronym for culture. So in the CX and culture connection, the C-U-L-T-U-R-E are all letters in an acronym, which I think makes it more memorable and easy and fun to talk about when you're giving a keynote to talk about the acronym and, and people walk away. It's just easier. It's the way we are as human beings. So I think the break methodology it's not only easy to remember, but it aligns well to the four rocks. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. And um, so, you know, what's interesting is when you use the metaphor of a river and rocks, it actually easily connotes this idea of there's energy and that there, you know, your customers are going on the journey, your employees are going on the journey too, and there's energy that they have. And if they waste their energy because of dealing with a rock that you could have removed, then that's a negative, but the journey itself can be fun and exciting. You know, I, I guess you might, maybe you want it to be all passive and calm, but I like to think of, you want people to have energy and have fun and along the journey too. Yeah. Well, and I call it getting in the boat with the customer. So if again, I, I'm gonna, I, I beat this analogy to death, but it's, if you're in the river you could be standing on the bank and, and you and the contact center are right on in your section and the, the web design team is upriver and then the chat team is downriver and you can all just be watching them go by and maybe you throw a lifesaver. You're trying to help them at that point. But the reality is get in the boat, get all of those folks together in the boat, navigating that experience with and for and on behalf of the customer and, you know, that way you're, you're, you're understanding their full experience. You're understanding upstream and downstream, but more importantly, how your work can influence and interact with others. I was working with a, a web team on a redesign of a website and, and they were like, oh, we want surveys. I'm like, you're not going to get, you're not going to get from surveys what you want. Let's do some journey analytics and text analytics. We put together the journey analytics to show here's all the customers that were online and then they called and then here's their 
here's the context of their calls. They got more value out of that. But, but what was even more impactful is when they actually sat down with some of the agents talking about that experience, because both sides learned a tremendous amount and created new processes to work better for each other. The, the call center team was like, hey, when this breaks, we need help figuring out how to you know, understand why it broke. You know, it's not just about, you know, is it, did it work or not? We need to be able to see that. Why did it break? And then, you know, then they gave feedback. The The digital team was able to give feedback to the call center and say, well, actually, if you ask these questions first, you'll be able to get further along with what the issue was and, and be able to resolve it faster. So it just that partnership alone, that employee experience is such a key part. It goes back to culture. It's such a key part of creating great experiences for the customers. Um, and it, it can't be done without. And therefore, you know, a lot of times too, if you don't have time or you're not ready yet to measure customer effort, measure agent effort. Ask your agents to take, you know, whether in Salesforce or a CRM or whatever, quick hit questions about how their effort was for certain processes. Because again, if it's hard for an agent to do, I guarantee you it's hard for the client or the customer. If you go through and map out the journey, you know, which you advocate in your book, you know, map out the customer journey um, and understand effort, both customer effort and employee effort, to your point, you can then look at all the initiatives today, cross-functionally, that are touching different aspects of the experience and new potential things you could add or change or drop. I, I think that every company has a roadmap of things they're working on. It's just fragmented in many cases. And they're not aware of all the things that are going on in the company. So just getting people to bring it together uh, in CX is a good first step to get create that shared understanding of the journey, to create you know collaboration across functions, across teams, so that you understand the roadmap, it becomes more of a shared roadmap. And then you can make changes and say, you know what, um, the, you know, these are the stories we're working on in a set of epics. And let's get alignment and get ongoing insights that solve those problems. A lot of what you're talking about is how you deepen the insights to work on particular stories, you know, that, 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 that can solve for the CX and, and make progress over time. And some of them will erode a rock. Some of them will replace a rock. It's they, they have different levels of impact and you're being intentional about what you do. Absolutely. And that's, that's the key to any improvement process. You've got to be methodical about what you're doing. You've got to make sure that you, you've got the data, you've got the partnership and the alignment, and then you've got the results. Uh, and and keep, keep that cycle going. Unfortunately, you know, customer experience is it's a marathon. A, well, it's a forever marathon because it never stops. You're always tweaking and changing and improving and you'll never get to a finishing point. Uh, but what's real important is that you're you're on that journey, you know, as an organization on behalf of your customer just as much. So we've been talking about, you know, employee experience and how it connects to customer experience in a few ways. One is the level of effort that employees spend. Another is there, there are sorts of insights themselves into the CX. Uh, another is you can free up their time to redevote to other things. Like, so what are the best ways to reinforce this linkage between EX and CX? So like, how, how, do, how do we make this even better by paying attention to EX and CX together? Well, I think the biggest thing is, uh, and this is part of, again, where generative AI and things are really changing, you know, how we even run contact centers. Um, you know, I, I've done CX, CX analytics and run customer experience programs my entire career, but I've done it from the call center, the contact center. I've done it from marketing. I've done it from product and pricing kind of finance role. I've done it from technology and digital team. So I've kind of had a, a gamut of experience influencing or, uh, my own experience, influencing the customer experience from a lot of different avenues. And each of the departments thinks differently, but the key is getting them to think and act in partnership together. And so the call center specifically, if you really want to look at it, the, the more technology we throw at customers, the more chatbots we force them to go through, the more the, you know, we, we make it almost impossible to get out of the IVR, the, the call routing tree and, and automation there. The more we do that, the more they're going to demand human experience. And I think the companies that take this new technology and focus only on removing calls, they're going to be losing in the long run. Those, though, that use this technology to create more value within the contact centers and foster greater value of the employee are going to be 
you know, much more ahead of the curve. I, I had an issue with a bank. I won't name them, but I literally had to call them once to twice a week for three months to try to get an issue resolved. And I was always hitting the contact center. I was getting somebody new. Nobody ever took ownership. You know, it's just that epitome of getting lost in the front line. Well, there's technology now that can be scrubbing my inbound call and say, wow, you've called, look at the frequency of your calls. This might be an elevated issue. And they can one, redirect you maybe to a specialty team proactively, or they could try to validate that you're calling about the same issue and then route you to the group. And then they could even take the summary of all those past notes of my previous calls and feed them to the next agent so they can see in summary using generative AI, wow, this is what they're calling about. And then even recommend a more value added approach to say, why don't we escalate here to this other group? Even if it took me offline, if after three calls, instead of continuing to do that once or twice a week, if they had said, all right, we're gonna get you to this group, they're going to you know, get in contact with you. You're going to trade some emails about the issue, but they're going to own the issue. I would have been happy never to call again if I got that kind of support. And that's what businesses are looking for when they say, I want to reduce call volume. We'll use the capability to don't focus on trying to reduce the, the cost of the cost center. Turn it into a value center because now same generative AI as I'm talking to a client you know, can be recommending, you know, cross sales, upsells. It could be recommending value added effort to the customer to, to bolster that relationship and the loyalty, maybe delight and finding ways to delight becomes easier within those frontline interactions because the tools will help the agent do that. And I think that's where we're going. And I think there are some companies that are embracing it. Others are waiting, kind of a wait and see, but this is a key opportunity and a key time to think strategically about how you're doing this, not in too much of a narrow focus on you know just one aspect of reducing calls or something of that nature. I agree. I think a lot of digital investment for a lot of companies is on reducing costs. And I think a lot of what they're focusing on is like you hear the phrase digital containment. You know, can you have or uh, an experience that doesn't touch a human being? that that's actually a missed opportunity in many cases, because if you look across the customer journey, unless you're Netflix, there's going to be human interaction in there somewhere along the customer journey. And, you know, it's also in many cases, if you try to remove a human interaction completely from it, you'll actually irritate the customer. So I think having that holistic lens and where the employees see that your goal is to improve the end-to-end -end experience, not remove them from it, they actually embrace digital more at the company. I've seen clients where the employees actually resist the digital transformation because they think the company's main goal is just cost reduction, and therefore they're they 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 they're, they're not their heart's not in it. They don't bring their whole selves to the program, and the program fails because it's 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 the employees don't buy in. Yep. Well, think Particularly about Particularly in healthcare and banks and, and markets like that. In, in healthcare, a lot of employees resist adoption because they think it's cost focused. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, think about it in financial services. If I'm chatting to, you know, uh, or I, I'm on the tool and I'm uploading and depositing some money from my bank into the financial institution, right? That's a self service. They don't want to take the call. But what about the company that looks at that and says, you know what? Through generative AI, I'm looking at your accounts. You're not getting the most out of your, your investments. You know, would you like, you know, your transaction is done, the money's on its way, but would you like to talk to somebody about your investment plan and what's, you know, where we could maybe get you additional, you know, results? You're actually, you know, now you've got technology that are kind of pushing the person to call and it, it, it could be looked at as like, well, we would never want to create volume, but yeah, but. Now that employee is receiving a call where they're adding value and it's real business results, real business value. And going back to people and employee experience, that's the biggest thing that most everybody wants to do. They want to know they're adding value to their role, to the customer and to their business. You give them more of that opportunity by using things to kind of funnel in that direction. You're going to change that mindset and that culture, because the more you talk about them as a, the, when I, the contact center as a con, a cost center and, oh, we got to reduce calls. The more people are thinking, oh, you're just trying to get rid of my job. Flip that and say, no, we want to add more value. We want to find better ways to get the right calls to you that can 
help us in the bottom line. Another example, um, I, you know, I was uh, in cable for many years. I worked in a cable organization and, and in telco and, you know, that epitome at back in the day, it's gotten better because most people don't have <laughs> television anymore through cable, but that annual raising of rates, it's about to happen, right? You know, well, if somebody's making a payment online, the biggest thing we started to look at and think about back at that, at, at that time was, well, we know their rate's going to go up next week. And we know it's going to go up by X amount, which is going to cause them to call and be angry and we'll end up giving them a discount. What if we, as they make that payment, say, hey, you know what? Your rates are going to go up next month. Why don't we look at ways that we can uh, not increase it by X, but, you know, reduce, still get, you know, give you a better price and get proactive about that instead of reactive. Again, that's where the technology is letting us do that. What you're applying here is a best practice that I'm going to make simple for the audience using the metaphor, the analogy of a restaurant experience. You know, when you go to a restaurant and they give you the bill and it comes with the candy, right? Well, why do they do that? They don't want the last thing you experience to be negative, right? So what, what's memorable in a customer experience? And that it, it's the, the first thing, the peaks and valleys, the rocks you're hitting, and the last mm -hmm. thing that happens. What was really cool about what you described, Sean, is that you turned a potential pain into a good experience by adding the candy with the bill. You're giving yeah. them a good experience so that it's not just the price increase. You're giving them something else, too, and it turned it into a positive. Yep. Absolutely. So that's really cool. I really enjoyed our conversation, and it, um, it definitely sparked some thinking for me. I, I'm, I'm sure it has for the audience, too. Um, I, beyond um, uh, checking out the uh, Four Rocks book, uh, you know, and I know that, um, you know, one thing that people could do is uh, if they want to take a step, they could reach out to you. Um, I know that uh, we talked about uh, doing conversations with people together. If that's of interest, I'd be up for that. Uh, so people can definitely reach out. Um, you know, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Is it over LinkedIn? Should they go to the uh, to your website? What? How can how can people follow up? Well, a great place to start is my website, and it's cx number four rocks dot com. So pretty straightforward, cx four rocks dot com. Uh, I have contact information there. You can fill out a form and connect with me. You can see more information about my pr processes, you know, my speaking and coaching and consulting that I do, but also on LinkedIn, uh, you know, I, I very much active on LinkedIn. So Sean Albertson, uh, I, I have found that when I, in launching my business, I'm not the, the, the only, you know, top Sean Albertson. There's actually a, a guy who edits some pretty big name movies who's Sean Albertson, who always tends to get the spot in front of me. Uh, but uh, I, you know, look, look me up on the, on the website or on LinkedIn, Sean Albertson, happy to connect with you. And again, the, the opportunity here is any organization could do this. One is you got to kind of get motivated to do it. And that's where I focus my keynotes. But the other is really understanding the way to use, again, what you probably already have in a more cr creative way that that creates the opportunity to make these kind of impacts. And that structure is what I like to teach organizations. So as I mentioned, Matt, you know, happy to work with you and talk to some folks uh, or contact me directly. It's just an awesome opportunity to be able to share this with, it, this with you. And thank you for having me on your podcast. It's awesome. Sean, it's been great to have you on the podcast. I really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, everybody, please be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast and definitely do feel free to reach out. Uh, we'd be very happy to have a conversation with you and we hope this sparks some great ideas for you.